We're going to have some share with your neighbor time this morning, which I know you all love. So with your neighbor, I want to know, have you ever had a quarrel with God? Some sort of disagreement, something has happened and you're not happy about it and you're not happy with the situation you find yourself in and you bring some sort of quarrel to God. If you have, if you're in the midst of one, share that with your neighbor. I'll give you one minute because it's a thinker. About halfway through our share time, remember that it doesn't have to be something that makes a lot of sense, but the Israelites had pretty good reasons to quarrel with God. They didn't have anything to eat or drink, so they're legit, right? So what has happened in your life that you've brought to God with a quarrel? Take about 20 more seconds. Was there something that everyone could think of that had been some sort of disagreement, some sort of argument you've had with God? Something that has happened where you've been upset? Did everyone have something? Or you maybe you knew you'd been upset, but you couldn't remember the situation? Yeah, yeah, there's a couple like that. Okay, okay. So this morning we read this text from Exodus. And this is a commentary about human nature and divine character. We learn a lot about people and about God in this text from Exodus. Uh, remember, this is right almost immediately after the people have been saved from slavery there in the desert. Uh, God said that God was going to save them, and so they trusted God, and uh, here we are. It would have been better to stay a slave in Egypt than to be out here in the desert with no food, no water, no shelter. Why did you do this to us? The people are pretty ticked off. Like, it may be an understatement. They're ready to stone Moses. Moses is worried for his life, right? And so right at the core of this story is a, is a story about Israel's history. The purpose of the story but is not to learn about the past. Is told so that we can learn about the grace and glory of God. But because the purpose of the story seems to be to understand the character of God, the story names an aspect of what it means that humans are fallen and broken creatures and what it means to have a gracious Lord. We start with a brief historical frame. Let's set the stage, right? From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. What has happened in the wilderness of sin so far? There's been nothing to eat. There's been nothing to drink. There has been no shelter. So, so far, God has fed the people. That is what has happened in the wilderness of sin. Manna rained down from heaven just a few verses before today's text. And it was just enough. Remember, the manna is just enough that they need for the day. They gather the manna they need for the day, every day, except for the Sabbath. Uh, for the Sabbath, they've gathered what they needed the day before. They gather double, uh, and they have fresh bread every day that comes from heaven. Uh, they complained to Moses and Aaron after they got there immediately because they were hungry. And God responded to those complaints with the manna from heaven. So when we talk about the wilderness of sin today, uh, it's a been there, done that sort of situation. You were hungry, I fed you. You're thirsty, I'm going to give you something to drink. Calm down, you're going to be okay, right? But is it easy to be okay when you're dying of starvation or thirst? Not really. Not really. We hear about this encampment, Rephidim, and it's an unknown location to us. It just hasn't, this is a place that we camped before, right? But the Hebrew name carries meaning. The Hebrew, Hebrew verb, Rephidim, means to refresh or to support. So we know what's coming in this space. The story of a simple camp out tells the reader the power of the Lord to refresh the Israelites. 
And the people here at this camp out, as they had at sin before, quarrel, quarrel with Moses. But this time it's with Moses, and Moses takes this quarrel to be something against God. Why do you test God? Give us water to drink, they say. The people don't complain directly against the Lord. They complain against Moses. Why did you bring us out here? Why did you bring us out here? Not God. We can't see God. Why did you bring us out here for us to die? The human body can survive a really long time without food. If you have something to drink but no food, you can go two to three months on no food and just water. But if you don't have any water, if you don't have any liquid coming into your body, the human body can last about three days. Did you know that? Three days without water. That's how long you can go. So the people have a legitimate concern. Their complaint is valid. The Hebrew here is also important. The Hebrew word rib, the word that is used for coral in the text, means lawsuit in the Hebrew. So it's more than just a complaint. It's more than a simple argument. It's more like bringing Moses and God up on charges, demanding to be released from the pain of thirst. Why did you bring us here to the wilderness to kill us with thirst? That is the lawsuit they bring against God. They are testing Yahweh, where before Yahweh, it seems, has been testing the people. It's their lack of faith in the way they turn on Moses. Moses, who, mind you, has just saved them from slavery. Moses, who has just delivered them from Egypt. Moses, who has been the means of grace for the people. This Moses is who they're coming to and who they're turning on. This lack of faith, some commentators call it hard-heartedness or stiff-neckedness or ingratitude, even name fear. This is the aspect of the human condition that we talk about today. And Moses responds to the complaint of the people with a complaint of his own, one directed at God, what should I do with these people? Uh, they're almost ready to stone me. I'm a little concerned. This is my job. And mind you, I was happy with the sheep. I was a shepherd. I was leading the sheep. I was happy doing that. And now all of a sudden I have these people. You know who doesn't stone you? Sheep. Sheep do not stone you. You know who doesn't argue with you? Sheep. You know who just does what you tell them to do, generally speaking? Sheep. So why, why did you put me in this situation? God says, don't worry about it. I saved you before. I'll save you again. Strike the rock at Horeb, but do it in front of the elders. Make sure the elders see what's happening, because they're the ones that are bringing these charges. They're the ones that are testing us. They're the ones that need to see the water spring forth. This lawsuit will be brought to a close when people see God is among them, when people see we're among them, and water flows freely from the rock. There are some elements of the Psalms of Lament in this story. Do you hear them? Don't worry, I'll tell you what they are. First, the people in Moses are in desperate situations of crisis. We start lament not from a happy place, not from something that is exciting that has just happened, but from situations of crisis and hopelessness. Both the psalmist and the people in the story face life and death situations. The people think they may die of hunger. Moses thinks he may die at the hands of his people. Uh, there's also the traditional you complaint of the Psalms, uh, a complaint to God. Moses complains to God, and we're told in verse 7 that the people said, Is the Lord among us or not? 
we are in a crisis situation. If God was among us, God wouldn't have let us be brought to crisis in the first place, right? Isn't that how it works? So where are you? We hear this repeated in the Psalms as well. There's also the traditional they complaint in prayers of lament. Moses complains about the people, especially here, the situation of crisis that tends to break down the community or cause community to turn against one another. And then there's a request. If you're here with us in the middle of the crisis, maybe at least you could save us from the crisis. Maybe if you couldn't prevent the crisis from happening, you could get us out of it. It's the request. And then God's response. God, who graciously and faithfully responds, not to the lack of faith, but to basic human needs. Because God is faithful, because God is with us, God responds out of grace and love. And God does so in a way that doesn't just provide for the physical needs. God restores community in this situation. We're kind of having a breakdown here. We've got a lot of people who are really mad. And when a lot of people are really mad, other stuff starts to matter a lot, too. Have you ever been really mad and then every little thing just sets you off a little more? It's what tends to happen. It's, it's what our brains do, right? And the people are scared. They're scared for their lives because they know that they need water to survive. And so there's a little bit of a breakdown happening here. Everyone is in the middle of this collective crisis, but they're all starting to have an individual independent crisis. But God responds in a way that helps restore the community to bring life back to where they are. Previously, when they were hungry, God caused bread to rain down from heaven. And here, working through Moses, God causes water to spring forth from the earth. Because God works through Moses, because God works through a human being, because God works through someone who is suffering with them, community is restored just as the people's bodily needs are met. Pretty amazing, right? When you read this story against the backdrop of Psalms of Lament and against the bigger picture of human nature, you can see that the story does not just look like an episode from Israel's past. It looks and bears witness to the characteristic nature of life and relationship with God. It's not just the people of Israel who are stiff-necked and hard-hearted and lacking in faith. At some point in our lives, it's all of us. It's easy to see that and reflect on that in the season of Lent, isn't it? Where have I been lacking? Where have I fallen short? It's not just the people of Israel whose community was threatened. It's true of our communities, too. It's not just the ancient Israelites who complained against God. We also complain against God. And sometimes we don't have very good reasons for it, but most of the time we have really good reasons for it. We hunger. We thirst. The Psalms of Lament, my friends, give us permission to take these complaining prayers to God. It almost tells us that it is authorizing complaining prayers as a part of our faith. Complaining and being in that relationship with God as well is part of what makes us human, is part of what makes God divine, is part of what helps us be in relationship together. Psalm 51, along with the Psalms of Lament, says, open our lips that our mouths may complain to God. If God doesn't know the problem, how's God going to help us find a solution? 
And if we don't start with complaining, how do we know what the problem really is? Sometimes it takes some talking to figure it out. But above all, above all, this story bears witness to the faithfulness and graciousness of God. The whole book of Exodus, the whole chapter, everything that we read about the entirety of the, the Israelite people in the wilderness is about the faithfulness of God. This is the message of Exodus, that God heard the people's groaning in Egypt. God heard their complaining there and remembered the covenant God had made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, remembered the covenant promise that was made that God's people, not the Egyptians, God's people would num be numerous as the sands on the earth. And it's on God to make that happen. We talked about covenants a couple of months ago, about those conditional promises, about how they're more than just a little, uh, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. They are about these mutual relationships with one another. And it often happens in scripture where God remembers the covenant. This is where we see change happen. When God remembers the covenant. When the people remember the covenant. When a quick shift is made, and it's a tiny shift sometimes. Water from the ground. That could have come from anywhere but it came through God with a relationship with Moses. We may quarrel with God. We may feel like we want to bring God up on charges, but it's God that resolves these quarrels. We may try to flee. We may try to push back on God's plans. Sometimes there's nowhere else to go. We're in the desert but it's always God who helps us in the end, who helps us to see where we are, who helps us to see all of our relationships in spite of what may be our unbelief. Thanks be to God. Amen.